Homo sapiens, who are we? Where do we come from? In chapter 7, we will continue our look at the genus Australopithecus with the help of paleoanthropology. Before we continue, let's digress for a moment. We call ourselves Homo sapiens. Where does this name come from? In general, it comes from the desire or the need of the human mind to quantify or categorize the world around us. Specifically, the term Homo sapiens arose out of the work of the Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus, who popularized the use of binomial nomenclature in his book Systema Naturae in Species Plantarum, published in the 1750s. The work of Linnaeus helped lay the foundation for the scientific or biological classification of life on Earth. Back in Chapter 3, we touched on DNA and the mechanisms of evolution. Scientific or biological classification is a way of categorizing or mapping biological relationships resulting from the evolution of the massive DNA gene pool that is inclusive of all life on Earth. If we took a look at the biological classification of Homo sapiens, we might see something like this depending on the taxonomic system used. We are listed in the kingdom Animalia being an animal as opposed to a plant, a fungi, a protozoan, or a bacteria. Our subkingdom is Eumetazoa, being a multicellular animal with differentiated tissue as opposed to the parazoa, such as sponges. Our phylum is chordata, meaning we display a notochord in early development, in the case of Homo sapiens in embryonic development. Our subphylum is vertebrata, indicating we have a backbone or a spinal column. Our superclass is tetrapoda, designating four-legged or four-limbed. Our class is mammalia, we nurse our young via mammary glands. Our subclass is steria, we give birth to live young without the need of a shelled egg. Our infraclass is eutheria, we are placental animals as opposed to a marsupial. Our order is primates, we display a wide range of characteristics including stereoscopic vision and adaptation to climbing trees. Our suborder is anthropoidea, we have stereoscopic color vision and large complex brains for our size. Our infraorder is catarrhini, meaning we have narrow down-facing nostrils and 32 teeth. Our superfamily is hominoidea, which includes humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and gibbons. Our family is hominidae, which includes humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. The members of this group would be called a hominid. Our subfamily is hominini, which includes humans, chimpanzees, and gorillas. The members of this group would be called a hominine. Our tribe is Hominini, which includes humans, chimpanzees, and all of the fossil ancestors of the genus Homo, such as Sahelanthropus, Auroran, Artipithecus, Australopithecus, and all of the extinct members of the genus Homo, such as Erectus and Neanderthalensis. The members of this group would be called a hominin. This brings us to our own genus Homo and our own species Sapiens. And to go a step further, our own subspecies Sapiens, which differentiates us from more archaic forms of Homo sapiens. For example, Neanderthals would be classified Homo sapiens Neanderthalensis, and we would be Homo sapiens Sapiens. If we look at this graphic overview covering the last 15 million years of our evolution, we note around the 14 million year mark, the human chimpanzee gorilla line and the orangutan line were undergoing speciation or a genetic split. Speciation occurs gradually over many thousands of years as a gene pool becomes divided. This division most likely arises out of geographic separation, but other factors may also play a role. Around or before the 8 million year mark, another speciation occurred leading to the genetic split of the human chimpanzee line from the gorilla line. This was reflected in the taxonomy which places humans and chimpanzees in the tribe Hominini and the gorillas in the tribe Gorillini. And as we've covered in past chapters between 7 million and 5 million years ago, the human chimpanzee line underwent speciation which led to the genetic split between the line of Homo sapiens and the chimpanzee line. The chimpanzee line underwent speciation around the 1 million year mark leading to the creation of the species Pantroglodytes and Pan Paniscus. Approximately 30,000 years ago, our closest remaining relative on the family tree Homo, Homo neanderthalensis, faded from existence, leaving us the sole living member of the genus Homo. Let's now return to our look at the genus Australopithecus with a trip to South Africa. Back in chapter 4, we took a look at the discovery of the first fossils of Australopithecus africanus in South Africa in 1924 by Raymond Dart. 
Fossils of Australopithecus africanus have been discovered at only four sites in South Africa. These sites are Tong in 1924, Sturkfontein in 1934, Makapansgat in 1948, and Gladys Vale in 1992. Before starting a detailed look at Africanus, let's take a moment for a quick overview of the genus Australopithecus. In past chapters, we have looked at Australopithecus anamensis in Ethiopia and Kenya. Anamensis lived from about 4.2 to 3.8 million years ago. We looked at Australopithecus afarensis in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania. Afarensis lived from about 3.8 to 3 million years ago. The species Australopithecus africanus has only been found in South Africa. Africanus lived from about 3 to 2 million years ago. Let's also mention the species Australopithecus bar el Ghazali. The fossil find of bar el Ghazali consists of a jaw fragment and about seven teeth. It was discovered in 1993 by Michel Brunet near Coro Toro in Chad. The fossil dates to about 3.6 million years ago. The most interesting aspect of this fossil find is that it is located about 2,500 kilometers west of the Great Rift Valley. This seems to expand the range of Australopithecus well into Central Africa. Though assigned to the new species Boreal Ghazali, some paleoanthropologists believe it is more rightly assigned to the species Afarensis as it falls in the same time range and within the variation parameters of the species Afarensis. Putting all of this together, we find the genus Australopithecus living over a span of about 2.2 million years or more ranging across Eastern Africa, possibly into North Central Africa. The time range of Australopithecus is from about 4.2 million years ago to around 2 million years ago. Around the 2.5 million year mark, we would find the first representative of the genus Homo, Homo habilis. This gives us about half a million years of overlap between Australopithecus africanus and Homo habilis. What role did Australopithecus africanus play in the evolutionary transition to the genus Homo? Let's see what the fossil remains of Australopithecus africanus can tell us. On April 18, 1947, Dr. Robert Broom and John T. Robinson were doing excavation work at the Sturkfontein site about 70 kilometers southwest of Pretoria, South Africa. Their efforts on this day produced the most complete skull of Australopithecus africanus ever found. Initially, the skull was assigned the binomial name Plesianthropus transvolensis, from which it got the nickname Mrs. Ples. The classification of the fossil was later revised to the species Australopithecus africanus. The fossil skull of Mrs. Ples has been dated to between 2.2 and 2 million years old. Originally, the skull was thought to belong to an adult female Australopithecine, but more recent studies seem to indicate that it was a sub-adult Australopithecine, possibly even a male. In August of 1947, Dr. Broom discovered another set of fossils at Sturkfontein, which include the pelvic bone from an Australopithecus africanus, which was strikingly human-like in appearance. This fossilized pelvic bone was one of the first discoveries to clearly demonstrate the bipedality of Australopithecus africanus. In Australopithecus africanus, we find a creature transitioning toward homo-like characteristics but still retaining ape-like aspects. It was bipedal but probably not with the agility or facility of modern humans. Male specimens of africanus probably stood four and a half feet tall and weighed around 90 pounds. Females would have been about four feet tall and weighed about 65 pounds. This would make africanus in general smaller than Australopithecus afarensis. However, the brain volume of Africanus was slightly larger than Afarensis with a range between 420 and 500 cubic centimeters. It is largely in the skull of Australopithecus Africanus that we can best see the differences between Africanus and the older Afarensis. The slope of the face is more vertical, the brow ridges are reduced, and the cheekbones are more narrow. The teeth are more human-like, and the shape of the jaw is parabolic as in humans. Endocasts of the brain of Africanus show significant increases in the frontal and parietal lobes in comparison to a chimpanzee's brain. This increase in size foreshadows the changes to the brain that will continue to evolve in the genus Homo. In Australopithecus africanus, we find incremental changes that are inching along characteristics which will become more pronounced in the genus Homo, such as flattening of the face and an increase in brain size. Let's wrap up our examination of the genus Australopithecus with a look at one last species, Australopithecus sediba. 
On August 15, 2008, paleoanthropologist Lee Berger was doing field work north of Johannesburg, South Africa on the Malapa Nature Reserve. His nine-year-old son, Matthew, was along on the trip. Matthew was exploring the area around the dig site. He came upon what he thought was a fossil bone and alerted his father. Lee Berger came to look and was stunned to see what he recognized as a hominin clavicle embedded in a rock. Upon turning over the rock, he discovered on the opposite side a mandible with several teeth. The fossils turned out to be a new species of Australopithecus, which was christened Australopithecus sediba. The specimen was a young male about 4 feet 2 inches in height. Further field work by Lee Berger's research team in March of 2009 turned up a skull which belonged to the same specimen. The fossils of Australopithecus sediba were dated to about 1.95 million years in the past. Australopithecus sediba shows a mixture of characteristics that are both akin to Australopithecus in the genus Homo. Lee Berger and his research team interpreted the fossils of sediba as being transitional between Australopithecus and Homo. Other paleoanthropologists argued that sediba represented a late branch of Australopithecines that was coexisting with Homo habilis. Homo habilis had made an appearance on the African scene at least 300,000 years or more prior to sediba. As Australopithecus transitioned to Homo, where to draw the line between the two was blurred. To help clarify the classification issue, other experts in paleoanthropology, such as Richard Leakey, were advocating reclassifying Homo habilis to Australopithecus habilis. Leakey felt that because of its small size and primitive characteristics, Homo habilis was a better fit in the genus Australopithecus. The association of stone tools with Homo habilis had been one of the hallmarks that had heralded the advent of the genus Homo. The lines of classification seem to blur even more when we consider a fossil discovery made in 1996. Paleoanthropologists Tim White and Bahrain Asfau, working in the Middlewash area of Ethiopia, discovered the fossil remains of a new species of Australopithecus which was christened Australopithecus gari. The most interesting aspect of this find was that it seemed to be associated with stone tools. The use of stone tools was thought to have arisen with the advent of the genus Homo and Homo habilis. The fossils of Gari were dated to around two and a half million years ago. This puts Gari in the time range of the appearance of Homo habilis. So what was going on in the time span of roughly two and a half million years to two million years ago? We have different species of Australopithecus coexisting with the early species of the genus Homo. In this time span, we would have found the Australopithecine species Africanus, Gari, and Sediba, not to mention the co-evolving robust Australopithecines, the genus Paranthropus, as well as at least one member of the genus Homo, Homo habilis. What we can gather out of this seeming chaos is that evolution is in and of itself a random and tumultuous process. It will never neatly bow to our nicely organized diagrams or simple linear models. The complexity of evolution will always appear a bit messy to the orderly human mind. Back in chapter 3, we looked at DNA and the concept of organisms as expressions of a gene pool. Over many thousands of years, these gene pools diverge and evolve in different directions. This is what we see when we look back on the time span of 2.5 million to 2 million years in the past. Eventually, the gene pools represented by the Australopithecines and the genus Paranthropus ran their course. The gene pool represented by our own genus Homo continues to buoy us along on its tide as we move forward into the future. And if we were to look farther into that future than we dare imagine, advanced forms of space travel could lead to our own human gene pool becoming separated by vast stretches of space and time. Homo sapiens might begin to undergo speciation. A million or more years in the future, we may find Homo sapiens marsrensis or Homo sapiens centaurensis living and thriving far from Earth. But the future of Homo sapiens is a story yet to be written. In Chapter 8, we will continue our quest to discover who we are and where we came from with the help of paleoanthropology as we begin a look at our own genus, Homo.